Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, where we're going to take a deep dive into the next wave of robotics for the medical implant manufacturing industry. My name is Michael Muldoon, and I head up the product development and sales at AVNR. And I'm really excited to share with everyone some of the knowledge and background that we've accumulated as we've developed robotic finishing and surface inspection solutions with the goal of making a real difference for our customers. First, I'm going to introduce everybody that's joining me. Um, First, JD House from 3M. Both 3M and AVNR have very similar missions in the realm of robotic finishing. While 3M says democratizing robotics, our slogan is, is really humanizing robotics. Essentially, these two terms have the same goal, which is enabling our customers to more easily integrate their process. JD started his career in 1991 and is a, a chemist by training, graduating from the North Dakota State University. He's been part of the abrasive system division throughout his career, touching all aspects from product development to process development to application engineering. And he's participated in the development of a number of transformative abrasive technologies, which we're going to hear about today, uh, Trizac and Cubitron. Since 2014, JD has an has been an application specialist focused on robotic abrasive processes. So JD, thank you for joining us. Yep, thank you, Michael. Next, I'll introduce David Mayotte, who heads up our robotic finishing development team. Uh, David has a bachelor degree in electrical engineering from Sherbrooke University and a master in precision robotics from the ETS. Uh, David is a huge advocate for our customers, understanding where they're going and leading the team to build finishing solutions to, to ensure they get there. Hi, David. Hi, Mike. We will start things off with an interview with Dr. Michael Weber, a spine surgeon at the Montreal General Hospital and associate professor at the McGill University. So Dr. Weber and his team are currently working on development of bone implants used as reservoirs for the local release of therapeutic agents in the site of the bone metisis resection. Uh, they previously developed a novel 3D printing fabrication technique of bone implants that are specifically designed to replace the defect generated after resection in a destructive bony metastasis. Now, before we get into the conversation, uh, what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll take a little step back and I'll start framing up what's happening in the robotics industry and, and sharing some interesting data. Um, robotics have been around for 60 years. Now, according to the U.S. Robotics 2020 roadmap, it, in 2018, global ro robot installations increased by just over 420,000 units. So that's 420,000 new robots going into operation. Um, that brought the operational stock of robotics to about 2.4 million units. The top biggest three users of robotics by country are China, Japan, and the U.S. in that order. It's estimated by 2022, an operational stock of almost 4 million industrial robotics are expected to work in factories worldwide. Um, and there's some companies that are betting pretty big on this to support this growth. For example, Fanuc Robotics just announced they plan to triple their monthly production at their main factory in Japan. Now, the US robots, Robotics Roadmap report also did a really nice job of outlining the biggest challenges company face when adopting robotics. For manufacturing, in order of, of uh, importance, they were cost, high mix production, safety, setup time, and something they call effortless, meaning the process of using the robotics should be effortless. So while there's some elements we're still working on, you'll see today there's been some interesting step forward on uh, some of these elements. So as we progress through the webinar, feel free to put any questions in the chat. We've set aside some time at the end um, to answer your questions. With Dr. Weber's busy schedule, uh, we recorded his interview on Tuesday. So I asked Dr. Weber to give us an overview of how these implants work and what are the important characteristics which manufacturers are required to achieve. Any questions for Dr. Weber, he promised to contribute to a blog after, and we'll take that opportunity to follow up. So with that, here's the interview with Dr. Weber. Dr. Weber. If, if you don't mind, if you could take a few minutes and just explain to us how these these implants work, uh, that'd be fantastic. Sure, Mike. So, you know, the human body has a number of joints and obviously the hip and knee uh, are two of the major uh, weight bearing joints uh, in the body that uh, degenerate uh, in a lot of us, unfortunately, uh, quicker than uh, we'd probably like to. And so, 
Uh, hip and knee arthroplasty or joint replacement is a very common uh, performed uh, surgery to replace these mechanical um, come, uh, joints in our body. Uh, so, you know, the knee uh, in particular, of course, um, has uh, it's an articulating uh, a hinge type joint, uh, which has both a femoral and tibial component. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we remove the articular surfaces of these degenerated arthritic joints and we replace them with these metal implants. Uh, these, of course, uh, are uh, meant to reconstitute the normal uh, mobility in those joints and allow patients to become mobile again and do the activities of daily living that uh, they enjoy and, and want to do uh, close or nearly uh, pain-free. Great. So when you're preparing for surgery, you know, what are, what are the things you're looking for? What are the, is, is there important quality characteristics that you got to keep an eye open for? Or um, how do you approach uh, uh, preparing for surgery? Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, preparing for surgery obviously has a lot of uh, implications. Uh, everything from figuring out whether or not the patient's a, a good medically, uh, you know, sound uh, surgical candidate to looking at the, um, the anatomy of the of the knee and deciding you know the size and, and type of implant that we'll we'll use. Um, you know, in the operating room itself, uh, when we're um, uh, done our cuts in the in the case of a, a knee replacement and we're looking to place uh, an implant, you know, the, these uh, implants are coming off the shelf. Uh, we've measured uh, uh, interoperatively the size of the components that we need. And we then pull them from the shelves and open them on our back tables and then implant them. You know, when we're actually implanting uh, these uh, components, uh, we're opening these implants for the first time and we're taking a gross uh, sort of inspection of them. You know, generally speaking, uh, the, the, the characteristics of the manufacturing at the time of implantation is the last thing on our mind. Truthfully, um, at that point, these things uh, better be 100% good. Uh, and if they weren't uh, like that, uh, that would be a major event. And that would be something that uh, uh, we, of course, would notice uh, at the time when implanting it. And it would become a, a written up uh, report back to the manufacturer as a significant uh, uh, cardinal event. So I'm imagining that, you know, avoiding their, uh, the, the patient outcome is probably a foremost on your mind and making sure that, you know, you're doing everything possible to ensure that there's a speedy recovery and, and these patients get their mobility back as, as quickly as possible. So, you know, what should there be an, an issue with the manufacturing or you, a defect? You know, what are some of the possible impacts that could have on, on this recovery? So joint replacement uh, surgery has evolved uh, tremendously over the last uh, few decades. And in large part that, uh, has had to do with the manufacturing side of things. So the implants are at a point now where uh, patients uh, can have these implants and they will last uh, 20, 25 years before needing any revision. So in terms of outcomes like you're asking about, usually it's patient outcomes and how long these implants last and how well uh, they function for those people over that period of time. We've seen, unfortunately, particularly in the past, uh, implants that weren't of the quality or manufactured the same way that they were today. And it's led to accelerated wear often, uh, which means that the implants essentially fail early. Uh, on the other side uh, of the articular surface, the uh, rough side often on the back end of the joint have either not integrated appropriately with the bone or, uh, for example, can become loose with the cement mantle. Also, a lot of the particle debris that can be generated can be very what we call osteolytic, which means the uh, normal uh, cells uh, in the area uh, become highly inflammatory, and they actually can cause things called pseudotumors or essentially uh, um, uh, masses uh, in and around the joint, plus uh, large uh, bony defects in and around the joint. So. The consequences of not having a well-manufactured implant and the standards uh, that, uh, frankly, are gold standards today can be 
devastating for the patient. And it's usually something that we see not necessarily, you know, one to two days out after surgery, but rather uh, those patients needing a revision surgery much earlier uh, than would be expected from the standard of care that we're able to do uh, at the moment. Wow, so there's some <clears throat> fairly serious impacts that can happen. And, you know, it, it, it's really great to have your perspective. Uh, we have so many conversations with these manufacturers, and, and I'll, I'll tell you that every single one of them takes the quality very seriously. So it's it's really interesting to see the perspective and, and the quality targets that, that they're going for and, and the, the type of impacts that um, the, the, the reasons why that uh, they take it with to such a high standard. So I really appreciate uh, your your contribution to our to our webinar and and uh, uh, thank you very much for for taking your time with us. Well, thanks for having me. This is a great initiative, Mike, and uh, I wish you all the best. Right on. Thank you, Mike, Dr. Weber. Well, as you heard from Dr. Weber, these these are critical parts. So our our mission to to uh, ensure that the the manufacturing is at the, the highest level of quality is 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 right on target here. Um, now, 3M has been working with manufacturers uh, along many steps of the process for for many years, and and generally there's quite a few steps. So JD, you know, maybe for, you've been around uh, in this working with the abrasives uh, in this industry for quite some time. Could you take us through some of these steps and, and what are the most you know important ones that that from your perspective that that need a lot of time and attention? Uh, yeah, Michael. So uh, you know here we have a, a very high level overview uh, of the of the manufacturing process, and of course because uh, I I know about the abrasives, there's there's more steps uh, here. Um, that show abrasive processing. Um, I, I don't, I'm not much of a foundry expert, and of course I don't know a lot about machining. Um, so we're just gonna cover those quickly. But um, starting out, uh, of course, these, these, uh, these implants are cast via uh, what we call an investment cast process, a very precise way uh, of, of mass, producing, uh, mass producing cast parts. Uh, and then after that, uh, after they come out of the casting process, of course, they they don't they don't look like a knee. Um, there's lots of excess material on there that needs to get removed. They need to get uh, machined into a into a net shape uh, and then polished. So after they come out of the out of the uh, out of the foundry, um, they all have what's called a gate, um, or at least one gate, sometimes maybe more. Um, and the gate is simply the place where the metal flows into the mold. Um, and so um, that all has to be ground uh, off. Sometimes these gates can be very large. Um, I've seen gates as large as maybe um, uh, 12 to 14 millimeters wide and, and perhaps as tall as 25 millimeters uh, that need to be removed. And that all gets ground off using, uh, using abrasives. Um, you don't grind it uh, all the way down to the surface, however, because with the, with the uh, with the abrasive processing on a robot, it's, it's not a CNC. It's not precise like CNC, so you leave a little extra. Uh, then the, then the, the knee, uh, in this case, will go to a machining process, either, uh, either machined, CNC machined, or CNC ground into a net shape. Um, and as it comes out of there, um, it needs to be finished. Um, so generally, when it comes out of grinding and machining, you have uh, what are called step overs, and you have uh, um, you know, places where you, you've moved your tool, uh, your tool and, and there's little bridges there and that sort of thing. Those need to be removed and then it needs to be uh, shined to a very high polish. So uh, after it comes out of that, that uh, the net shaping process, um, then it, it goes to uh, what we call belting. And so uh, the, the, very, the various parts of the knee are, are uh, not, not the knee isn't necessarily processed with just one belt. You have to have different sizes and shapes to get into all the little uh, areas of the knee, um, the top sides, and when what we call the box area, um, these three very narrow file belts, um, that sort of thing. And and so we step that down in this belting process. We'll use a sequence to, of what we call trizac belts to uh, to take that all the way down to a pre-buff finish. 
Um, and then um, some, some customers choose to do a one-step buff. Some customers will choose to do a two-step buff. Um, but then it's a very short buffing process, um, and you've got uh, you've got your your polished knee. Um, and then, of course, we've got the inspection part. Um, you know, measure, and there's inspection along the way. I should I should add, uh, especially during the belting process, there's inspection that goes along. They uh, the uh, operators will have gauges to make sure that they're not over processing or under processing that sort of thing. Um, all throughout that process. And then at the end, of course, you have the importance of the visual inspection um, to, to ensure the quality um, that uh, Dr. Weber has said is, is so important. So in a nutshell, that, that's kind of an overview of the manufacturing process. Yeah. In, in your lab, what, what type of processes do you, do you see often? You know, I, when I had the tour, I saw a lot of, uh, it was very impressive with the, the, the robotics, uh, the grinding processes. Yeah, so we will see, you know, equally probably uh, in two areas, the, the, uh, the grinding or the degating, grinding this gate down, um, and then the belting process. Um, I, I would say, you know, I, I guess I would say probably, probably equally in both that we have uh, uh, for applications coming through our lab. Um, I will say that uh, particularly in, in the belting, um, that that uh, Trizact has been around um, for for 25 years uh, now, and uh, it's it's fairly well embedded uh, in the in the manufacturing of orthopedic implants. Um, and and in fact, I would say between golf clubs and, and orthopedic implants back in the 90s, is th those are the those are the parts that put Trizact on the map. Um, so we, processes are fairly standard. Uh, in in belting when using Trizac, the sequences are maybe only change a little bit. The uh, the type of machinery used, the type of uh, setup, the contact wheels, the speeds, the forces, all that. Um, I, you know, I, I hate to say that it is standard because, uh, as with all abrasive processing, there's always a little wiggle room. Um, but but it, it we have we have much experience, a lot of experience uh, in the robotic processing. Uh, of orthopedic implants, uh, you yeah. know, like say the 25 years. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about the standardization because one thing we noticed, we spent a lot of time in the aerospace and, you know, when you're talking about cast or forged parts, we saw a lot of similarities when we started looking at the medical industry and, and the way they manufacture the parts and the different steps. So we, we found a, a lot of standardization, a lot of co commonality uh, in the way they process their metals. Yes, for sure. Yeah, both investment casting uh, is very heavily used in, in those two uh, areas. And yeah, I, I would agree that there's a lot of very similar processes. Yeah, great, great. So what we'll do now is we'll frame up a little bit of the problem statement of, you know, when we started looking at the market space um, and our planning for, you know, how can we really make an impact with with our customers in the medical field? You know, considering we've got uh, the background in aerospace, but the language was different, and and it, it's really a, a space unto itself. You know, despite there is some commonalities, but we, so when we started to look at things, here's the some of the key characteristics that that we found were important. You know, um, a lot of these companies they had been implementing robotics for many years and you know pretty much everyone we spoke with has at least one robot on their floor which is which is fantastic you know they're they're used to the technology and and they come with certain expertise and and they ask really good questions when we start having those discussions um, now we did find that there's still some finishing operations were not automated so our goal is to you know understand you know what's out there What's what are the gaps, and then systematically start knocking off those those tougher areas that they have not yet been able to achieve. Um, one important thing about this industry is the cost of change is high. So it's you know when we have those good questions and and when we get into a project, it's very important that we deliver on on what we say. So you know, the turnkey aspect that was important in aerospace, it's it's very important in the medical industry as well too. Um, when we started looking at the, the different robotics that were out there, we did find that a lot of them were very large, uh, took up a lot, of, a big amount of floor space. Um, 
some of the feedback we had was there were some problems with consistency and rework in the automated process. So, you know, we started to look and we started to wonder, do, do these have to be uh, adaptive processes because of the, the forging or the, the casting operations? Um, and traditionally, it was difficult to automate or to innovate with some of the existing systems due to the complexity and, and just the way that they were laid out. Um, and when you go to innovate and, and try and you know do process improvements, you know data is is an important element of that. So um, with the current tools that they had in in some of the belting operations, grinding operations, if you wanted to gather some data to understand the process, you know they typically was fragmented or there was a lot of work just getting the data to understand you know what was happening. So. What we'll do now, we'll we'll go into a case study about, uh, and we're going to focus on these uh, for this one and some of the key areas there, and what we've been able to, uh, what we the solution we put together as for that problem space. Um, you see that we have the BFX 200C platform, which is an existing robotic platform. Uh, we've used this in the aerospace industry many times. And we found that that fit very well into the size of parts and the manufacturing environment. It's got a footprint of around two meters by 1.7 meters, which saves a lot of space. Um, and we, we very carefully planned the layout of the system to, to ensure we can get a variety of tools in there. So whatever the process that we get into, um, there's a tool that we can control very, very carefully that process. Um, the pivoting belt system has multiple arms, allowing us to vary combinations of belt designs, fingers, and contact wheels as we start putting together this process. Then you see Brainwave, it's, it's really our robotic finishing operating system. And that brings everything together and has tools targeted at robotic finishing to make development and production runs easy. Um, our goal is really to allow the to have our customers to focus on the process and brainwave takes care of the rest so when we start talking about finishing operations with a customer it starts where those abrasives hit the hit the part in the material removal um, these abrasives play a critical role in all of this and so we'll start there um, and we'll talk about uh, uh, the different abrasives. So JD, you know, maybe you can just give us an overview. You talked a little bit about Cubitron and Trizac. Um, the thing that we we find uh, in our process development uh, is you guys seem to have, you know, a, a solution for every job and there's a lot of subtleties that go into this. So we love being able to step through the different combinations. And uh, so maybe just take us through, you, you know, what is the Cub Cubitron and Trizac and, and what your goals are for automation. Yeah. So uh, first, you know, uh, let me start by saying, you know, so the, the orthopedic, uh, what to, to us, what makes the orthopedic industry unique to other industries is, of course, the high standard of quality, the, the extremely high standard of quality. In a sense, they're looking for very, you know, very similar things that other manufacturers are looking for, you know, the throughput and quality, uh, you know, being able to uh, uh, address the, you know, the shortage of labor. Um, that sort of thing, but you know, it's it's like they're like every other manufacturer, only to a much higher degree. So, for instance, when we talk about the abrasives in in robotics, um, you know, things that 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 all manufacturers are looking for, but particularly orthopedics, um, of course, are are finish quality. Um, that's that would be number one on the list. Um, also looking for consistent form, uh, performing products. Um, you have to consider, this is uh, from an old colleague of mine who's since retired, uh, who always said, you have to consider that from the very first moment you start using that abrasive, it's changing. And so we, here at 3M, we put a lot of effort into, into making sure, ensuring that it changes as little as possible from beginning of life to the end of life. Mm -hmm. um, Throughput, of course, uh, is very important. Uh, this is a high growth industry. We still have a lot of baby boomers, of course, who are going to be needing uh, knees uh, over the next uh, 20 years or so, something like that. So throughput um, is an issue. Um, I, I would say uh, other things uh, regarding, regarding the actual abrasives. So we talked about being consistent performing. We talked about um, um, speed. Uh, of throughput, 
um, and and long life, of course. Um, so in in ortho, you know, in orthopedics and other robotic manu abrasive manufacturing, uh, you know, it, it belt changes are a are a bigger deal uh, or product changes rather than they are in, for instance, a manual process. So uh, in a, a manual process, an operator standing right there, you you take a guard off, you put a new belt on, and off you go. Um, but in in uh, in robotics, of course, there's there's uh, lots of safety uh, protocols that they have to do. Sometimes they're uh, double keyed, you know, there are safety interlocks, that sort of thing. You know, it takes a little bit longer. And it's like another colleague of mine uh, once said, you build you build a robot cell for uptime, not downtime. So they're looking for they're looking for long life, consistent performing products first, and I would say um, throughput and speed. Um, secondarily, uh, what we see. Um, I should. I, I would also like to point out that we very often see, in fact, more often than not, um, we see um, when moving from a manual to a robotic process, there's actually a lower consumable cost um, per part. And that is, we're able to extract um, the maximum value much easier uh, out of a product in a, in a, uh, in an automated situation, whether it's robotics or flat finishing or that sort of thing, uh, because we can control all of those parameters and we maximize them for optimum life. So, um, those are, those are the sorts of things that uh, we look for, um, when we're helping develop an abrasive process, how do we maximize the process, not only for the part, um, that the customers need, but also for the abrasive so that the customers can can get the maximum value. And, and we believe we have, you know, those features in, in our, in our, you know, in, in 3M, in, in our 3M products, particularly in the Cubitron 2, the Trizac, uh, and the Scotchbrite brand products. Yeah, yeah. yeah. bring up yeah. a couple of interesting yeah. points. And yeah. uh, when you talk about um, uh, the abrasive savings. And uh, I've often asked you guys this, you know, you, you know, at 3M's put a, I think it's around 12 robotic labs around the world. And, you know, your, your mandate is there to, for abrasives. So why would you invest so much in robotics when it's saving abrasives? But, you know, you know, you guys really have this vision of that is the future of, of robotic finishing. And so you want to be part of that, that conversation. And, and, you know, we do have a lot of customers that, uh, that, Good portion of their business case is built on on the savings that they can they can achieve from optimizing that that process and ensuring that the full life of that abrasive is used properly. Um, yeah. And then, of course, you know that's a great observation. Quality is number one. And once we get through that feasibility, th the second question is always cycle time, right? So everyone goes, "Oh, okay, that's nice." How long did it take you, right? So that's uh, that that uh, the point about the the throughput and and the growth that the industry is facing that that's certainly high in everybody's mind. Yeah, I, I you know one other thing I would add is you you know we do very often um, of course in a, in get questions about product life um, you know a priori before the cell is built and and uh, that's that's always the most difficult to answer. Um, you know, pr products can, product life can vary quite a bit depending on your actual part geometry, how much of the, you know, how much of the, of the processing you want the robot cell to do versus uh, touch up maybe afterwards. Right. There's a lot of things that go into that. And so, um, you know, full disclosure, that's where we start to be, wave our hands a little bit more. <laughs> it's just very challenging to, <laughs> to estimate product life. I would say that uh, it's much easier in the grinding space um, simply because we, instead of using actual customer parts, we use, we'll use uh, stock, you know, metal stock for a proxy for the gates. So it can be easier there, but it, we're just not equipped to handle, you know, a high volume of, of customer parts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the same goes for cycle time. So it's often we got to try the process first. Right, and then we f figure out where it sits on that uh, the cycle time standing, and and as you go through the iterations, you know how many, uh, what's your belt change, uh, how many parts can you get out of a belt? You can start getting that data. Um, you're right about the geometry. That is some, sometimes you just got to try it. And and you know after the uh, you know even after cells are installed, we have customers who are who are looking at 
further optimizing um, abrasive life. And, uh, you know, we want to be there uh, to help them do that. Uh, yeah. So we like to follow it all the way through uh, from, from conception to installation and, and service, help service those cells beyond, uh, beyond installation. Right. Well, maybe that's a good segue into um, what we'll do now is we're going to show a little uh, video of uh, finishing cell in action. And David's going to walk us through uh, some of the tools that we have for creating the recipe, uh, how it how it gets created, how we can iterate through some of these experiments and, and tests and trials and ensuring quality is there, understanding cycle time. Um, he'll talk a little bit about, you know, the key areas that we focused on and uh, some of the, 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 the data collection that is all built into a, to our operating system here. So with that, David, I'll, I'll let you take the, the floor here. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, yes. And as we just talked about belt, uh, belts, uh, let's start by seeing some belting processes. So here we have um, the con well, well, a belting process on the, the condyle surface or articulating surface, sorry. So uh, mainly done to get to a specific surface finish. And in a second, you'll see another uh, area where we can go, uh, which is the uh, knee box polishing or belting. So this is a much more, um, much more, a much uh, tighter area. So uh, more difficult to access, of course. And it got, it's got uh, some tight radiuses uh geometries that are not that easy to access or to polish such as the, the cam area so those are a uh, portion where we uh, get uh, good help from a 3m to choose the right abrasives of course um but where we need also to use our all our tools um, mainly uh from either mechanical tools such as contact arms uh, specifically designed for that type of uh, process or software tools where, uh, which we're going to see a little further on in the video but uh, which helps us uh, create and adjust trajectories. Um, so closer shot at the knee box polishing here. Again, for us, so we get, we're looking for a specific surface finish. Um, and that's um, ultra polishing example where we use uh, software abrasives with a uh, compound to get uh, to what we call a uh, super finish or to get to a mirror surface finish. So um, that's uh, another operation we can tackle. Uh, as I was talking earlier, here's a brainwave interface, interface uh, where we, which we use to design trajectories, uh, fine tune, visualize, and run the system. So here's an example of a trajectory done in a, in a knee box area. Uh, we can uh, change the orientation of the trajectory. Uh, we can change. Uh, parameters um so example of parameters are the way we change it right here so here we're changing the um, the cutting speed so tool speed we can change the robot speed as well we can change the force um and it's pretty easy to um to do so we you just have to select the specific parameter you want to change like here we're selecting the force changing force on specific points um, and we can even um, create an interpolation. So you you just specify uh, values on two points, and then you uh, you select the interpolation function so that you can have a nice variation of this parameter in between two points. So that's all. Uh, oh, you can also hide or, or uh, hide some points so that the robot doesn't go on those points of the path. Here we see uh, the visual visualization tool. So you can see uh, the robot path being executed in the system. So that's all embedded in Brainwave. Um, so that way you can get a full control of your process and it's easy for you to validate if the modification you've done um, are, are really what you wanted to have. Uh, you, on the left of the screen, you can see the robot going through all the points of the path um, and it would be highlighted if there would be any unreachable uh, points or um, any any other uh, or some other issues. And you have here, you just uh, we just saw the uh, navigation points perform uh, done to uh, or uh, defined to help the robot go through uh, one workspace to another. 
Um, what we see here is also the ability to gather data from uh, parts that have been run. And then uh, you can compare some data and compare specific uh, uh, parameters. Uh, if ever there is an issue on a part and you want to see what went wrong, as an example, what went wrong, sorry. As an example here, we're going to compare forces, uh, which is the force that has been uh, sensed by or felt by the robot while performing the parts. And you can compare different parts one with another and see that there are differences uh, that weren't supposed to be there. So you can have some more information on what happened uh, on specific parts if there was an issue or something like that. So um, before um, going back to you, Mike, just a recap. So first we saw some belting operations on different portion of, uh, of knees. We saw then in Brainwave that we could create trajectories, uh, play with the different parameters, robot speed, uh, cutting, uh, cutting speed, um, uh, forces. We could also put uh, some offsets on the point. So this all, those are all tools to help uh, the clients um, take control of their process and mm, easily change and adjust uh, or fine tune their recipes. Then you can visualize what it gives or the results. And uh, lastly, we showed that we could also gather some uh, data and we're gonna talk about industry 4.0, but that's a, uh, a step in that direction. So you wanna, we can gather some data here, which we call part results. And you can then compare those, um, those data and this is, Really powerful. This, these are really powerful tools for clients, um, so that they uh, get you know a better grasp on their process, better understanding of their process processes. Uh, compare some part to part, or even um, analyze what happened in the past, so that they can optimize the process further down the road. And you know, you just talked about optimizing cycle time, optimizing tool life. So those are all. Uh, information that can be uh, used uh, in that sense. So um, I leave it up to you, Mike, for uh, okay. for the next uh, slides. Great, thank you, David. And you know, I, what I've what we've started to see in the, uh, with our customers is they've what used to be a manual process now is a is an automated process. But on top of that, it provides information about what's going on in production. So we've had situations where, you know, the customer's uh, production at previous steps started trending outside of what they would call good parts. And uh, they, they were able to go onto our system and, and look at the data and, and pinpoint, you know, that where that uh, that deviation started. So it's, it, it, once you have that data, it starts opening up other areas that you can start thinking about and, and uh, using. Yes, and if I might add, uh, Mike, you see that Brainwave has been developed uh, as, really as a robotic process tool. So it helps you sequence and um, sequence operation, but not only that, it helps you gather data, as you just mentioned. Yeah. And it's really oriented around you know robotic processes, uh, which makes it a really powerful tool. Great. Now uh, we'll jump to the uh, into something a little bit different now outside of the robotic finishing, but it, we're still touching surface. So it's our surface inspection um, solution. Um, now going back to the throughput, uh, JD, um, when we approached this, especially on that uh, articulating surface, that super shiny surface, five years ago when we took a look at it, our cycle time was about an hour. And, and everyone said we were crazy, um, but we didn't give up. Three years ago, we were down around 20 minutes. Now today, with the solution we've put together, the team has found a way to get that under two minutes. So this is, has become a, a very feasible solution in terms of throughput, being able to make sure that these uh, parts are are uh, of the utmost quality and that final inspection. When we start doing our CPKs and, and compare or benchmarking against operators, um, this type of solution for looking for nicks, stains, scratches, missed operations ends up being a very repeatable and accurate solution, uh, ensuring that all areas of this part are, are very closely inspected and um, giving good results. 
So there's been a lot of breakthroughs in, in that, and that's that's something that looking forward, uh, we're very excited about with our customers. Um, you can see some of the different examples of defects here, dents, uh, pits, and in, in not just on the easy surfaces, we're getting into the, the really shiny surfaces and the, the very curvy surfaces as well too. So this opens up a lot of potential, we believe, for not only the, the ensuring quality, but also the data that gets associated with it as, as the algorithms and AI become more and more advanced and, and integrated into manufacturing, it becomes a quite an interesting area. Now tying all this together, um, what what our goal is, is to be building blocks for what everyone's talking about, connected factory and industry 4.0. You know, my experience you, when you get into some of these buzzwords is um, I remember the days back with lean manufacturing and everybody grabbed their lean manufacturing book, they read it, and then they went out on the, the shop floor and started walking and measuring how far, do, how far do parts travel, how many handles do they have, and they started making adjustments and there was a big uh, gain in efficiency uh, just with lean manufacturing. Now with Industry 4.0 and the Connected Factory, it's a different set of tools to, to solve problems, right? So no longer is a milling machine or a, a robotic finishing center, it's, it's no longer enough to just do the process repeatable time to time, but it, it's also an information system. So when we look at the, the what's going on with this, um, that's our approach to it. And we wanna be building blocks for this, for this in, uh, environment. Um, so whether we're talking about uh, robotic finishing with brainwave uh, going from uh, 3D models, getting inputs from collaborative robots on uh, the way you teach parts, but making those adjustments and then collecting the data um, to our, our visual inspection in the, the ASIS uh, software platform. Um, we're there to enable uh, this data to come back so the manufacturing engineers have a different set of tools to improve their production and iterate on uh, different improvements. <laughs> David, is there any um, elements that you'd like to, to touch upon for um, uh, the industry 4.0 and, and what you see coming? Well, we discussed a bit about um, data related to parts. Uh, I think that's something that's uh, um, and uh, that's uh, going to be something really big in the future because, well, in the near future, because, um, I mean, uh, traceability for a lot of different type of parts is something important. We've seen it in the aerospace industry, and I believe that's something that's going to come up in the medical industry as well. And not only that, but um, with those those information and gathering the data is, has become much easier right now, storing data as well. And there are really interesting tools to compare data, and that enables to understand the production and where optimization can occur. So I think that's some, uh, those are some key points um, that I'm looking uh, forward in the future, yeah, to see. Yeah. JD, how about you? Have you seen any changes in you know the, the types of conversations you have with customers now that they understand or are able to turn the dials on these, uh, how they use the abrasives? Is there, uh, is there different questions or different information that they're looking for? Uh, well, the, the biggest thing that I see is, is um, you know, people, at, people, there's a need out there to be able to do their own programming. Um, and, you know, as far as uh, data gathering, um, certainly I hear a little bit of that, but it, it's really more around um, the usability of their system. Um, how easy is it for the customer to program a new part? Um, or tweak uh, an existing process, um, that sort of thing. And, and that's where, you know, I, I see um, things like the Brainwave software really, um, really uh, helping out the uh, customers. Yeah, you know, we've had uh, a couple situations where customers have come back to us and said, you know, you guys said you couldn't do this, but check out what I've done with your machine. And, you know, we're blown away by it. We love the story. Um, and it, it it sharpens our, we have to sharpen our, our skills a little bit, but uh, to me, it's, it's a sign that, you know, that the software we're putting together, it's intuitive and the, the folks that know their process and their part are able to use it as a tool to push to the next level. And, and I think that's important for as the industry grows and people using robotics a lot more. And Absolutely. Think, oh, go ahead, David. I was just about to add that uh, we hear about those, uh, 
you know, one of products, you know, where, you know, the, the, the industry is going uh, more and more towards, you know, having products that are customized one by one. So having the tools here that are easy, easy to use for clients directly, I mean, it's a step in that direction as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's a step towards more high mix uh, parts. Right. And yep. And so we also, you know, see this as you know a way to democratize the robotic processing because, as you pointed out, people people our our customers know their abrasive processing. They know their finishing. They know what they need, but they don't often know how to change the robot to be able to do that. Or manipulate all of the process conditions, and this is a solution that that uh, that would really help them be able to do that. Great, great. So we've got 15 minutes left. So with this, what we'll do is we'll we'll go and look at some questions from uh, from the audience. What is the biggest hurdle you see with someone wanting to use robotics for surface finishing? I I, I suppose I think maybe. I would put uh, co you know sell cost in there probably as 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 number one. Um, yep. You know uh, when you when you tell customers it's going to be you know X hundred thousand dollars three hundred thousand or if you're you know inspection and a lot of different belt stations and that sort of thing it can easily get to be a half million or more and so um, so what I I like to do I always like to tell customers up front uh, give them a, a thumbnail estimate you know about what this is going to cost, you know, order rough order of magnitude, um, and that helps kind of separate ones who are, are really interested or are able to accept that, um, and the ones and the ones that aren't. So I, I suppose that's up there. And then we also have customers asking a lot about, well, how do you know how do I learn how to program it? We get that question a lot, um, and so oftentimes our answer is, well, you know, you want to you want to you know, have someone uh, send them to off to, uh, you know, FANUC or ABB or KUKA or whomever, their college, whatever color robot you have, and learn how to program. Um, so, but I could, you know, this with the brainwave, um, that, that might make that hurdle um, a lot, a lot shorter. Yeah. yeah, and the, the data supports what you were saying. Uh, when I was reading the U.S. Robotics Roadmap, they said the number one uh, uh, barrier was cost. So there is a big push to uh, uh, by not only us, but also the, the robot manufacturers to lower that that entry point and, and come up with solutions that everyone can adopt and democratize it from, from that standpoint. David, you were going to say something? Um, it's really related to cost. Uh, I was about to talk about uh, about cycle time, mm -hmm. and um, as you mentioned, as we uh, mentioned earlier, I mean, cycle time is a, a huge, uh, huge aspect of um, the ROI of uh, of getting uh, an automated system, and I think uh, that's something we we still need to tackle. It's always something. Um, a, I mean, we always looking. We're always looking to to get better. So there, there's never an end where we go like, okay, that's good. There's always, you know, we're always looking yeah. for improvement in there, and um, that's kind of the uh, the uh, the compromise you need to do as well with the um, the fact that uh, you're gonna get a consistent uh, consistent process. So sometimes you you know there's a compromise to do at different uh, on different aspects. So. I think that's uh, another point where it's uh, there. There's some. There are some challenges there on the on the cycle time uh, aspect. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you set that that benchmark, uh, someone comes in the next and says, "Okay, right. can we can we improve by ten percent?" Right. Mm -hmm. So we got to. You always have to be spinning your wheels on that. Um, another uh, question came in here. So, what are some of the biggest lessons we've learned through the development of this product? So maybe I can talk a little bit about this. So, you know, I've been uh, with AVNR since 2007, and I saw us as a company go through a, a number of transformations. And and what we found, uh, um, you go through different bottlenecks as a company as you try and to grow and scale, right? And so we've we've iterated through a number of different uh, uh, kind of platforms and, and approaches to the market. At one point, you know, our mechanical design team. Um, we were designing systems from scratch every time, 
right? And so that was a, a bottleneck for us in, in getting systems to market. Then what we said is, you know what, instead of trying to do something uh, every time, let's try and build a platform that goes 80% of the market. And then quickly after that happened, it went into the robotic uh, expertise, you know, and having sharp engineers and, and you know, getting enough uh, that we can get these robots out into the field. And so as we started iterating through how do we manage that and, and get people up to speed, that's where Brainwave started to, uh, the first iterations of Brainwave. So it's been about three, four years that we found solid footing on this, this platform. And the focus has been less on um, having robot expertise is having people understand the process. So, you know, when we sit down with customers, we ask all types of questions about, you know, the actual process itself, what abrasives are they using? And so now we find that it, it's shifted. And that's our that's our next iteration is making that process easier and some of the tools that are, are specific for robotic finishing and, and belting operations and, you know, the marrying the, 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 the belts to that robotic process is, is an important element of that as well too. So it, it changes, uh, um, as we as we evolve i think one uh, one of the positive thing we we saw is that um as you mentioned we moved from a really custom uh, approach to something that was more standardized and we uh we really looked uh or, or really made sure that we designed things so that they can be modular and so that it can be reused or reconfigured easier so that's something that we could leverage when we uh, when we uh, we we got to the um, uh, in the medical market because uh, not only in terms of hardware but in terms of software as well. Uh, so you know, uh, even though we were we were talking about robotic finishing, um, the parts they still have their specificities from one market to another. The you know specific expectations as well uh, and specific ways of programming things. So um, one really positive aspect is because we were cautious of getting our tools modular, we could, we could reuse them or you know pinpoint what needed to be tweaked for the medical market and so, so that the adjustments were, uh, weren't too, uh, too large. Another question came in, uh, when defects are identified by the vision system, do you find customers prefer to address manually touch up or send back for another cycle at the robot? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, I think that's the, you know, the, the, the pinnacle is that inspect and repair. Um, uh, having a, you put a part in and, you know, you do some inspection and it finishes the part. Doesn't matter what you have in there per se. Um, we, we've got, uh, uh, an ongoing project for marrying the two together in, and this is touching more on the, the aerospace field in the MRO market. And there's a lot of high value parts that are being, uh, repaired and, with critical operations. And if, if you remove too much material, um, you end up scrapping that that very expensive part. So that that's something that is definitely on the roadmap. Um, what we find right now, so when we put, when we look at the vision systems, uh, typically it's targeted at final inspection and there's a whole QN process. So the way we set up the system is it's, it's an aid to the quality department. So as it goes through all these critical parts, it'll sort which ones needs further attention. And then that quality person does their QN. So whether they repair, and it might be in the case you imagine an articulating surface that that ultra polish, that super polish there, um, there's maybe no good way of touching that up without having to redo the, the, full, uh, the full surface in order to get a proper blend. Okay, good. So we have five minutes left. We'll take a few more questions. Um, we have a question here. Can the robotic pro programming be done offline without affecting production? Yeah, of course. There's a, that's one of the main uh, goal of uh, Brainwave. So being able to program the part, create a trajectory is offline, um, and even do some tuning offline if, uh, you know, if ever you can you know, um, you know where to, to modify some specific things. 
and the the whole idea there is to you know uh, minimize uh, downtime on your uh, production floor. So um, the idea is to go. You can start from a three D model, create the path, um, set your um, if you know like the abrasive speed. Um, a robot speed you should use the force you should use you can out program this prior to you know to go on the machine you can even uh, simulate uh, right within brainwave um, and, and and you can do some other simulation as well with specific robot programming if you wish to and then you can go on the shelf floor not gonna lie some I mean you, you sometimes need to do some tuning but I mean it, the idea is to minimize this tuning um to um to really uh to to get a uh, as as a few downtimes as possible uh on the production line and that's something i mean we we're doing uh, and our our clients are actually doing uh for real so it really happens and david if somebody's used to a certain cad package let's say master cam or or likewise uh, is there is there any limitations as the type of import we can do if they want to use uh, their CAD package as opposed to uh, from within Brainwave itself? Yeah, uh, actually, Brainwave's got this um, CamCAD importer, so you can generate trajectories from uh, NX or, I don't know, Ketia or any any you know software that allows, uh, allows you to create a path for uh, CNCs. You could create a path. You need to export it in a specific format. And then you can exp Im import it, sorry, in Brainwave. Um, so I like to say that Brainwave idea, Brainwave's idea is to be as CamCAD uh, software is for CNCs, but for robotics. Mm -hmm. And even more, I mean, we can import some uh, some some trajectories from uh, CamCAD software into Brainwave, and that uh often uh, helps our clients because they often already have the expertise of creating tragic uh creating trajectories with those type of software so uh it's uh you know it's, it's a transferable uh knowledge from TNTs to robotic great so maybe we'll do one more question um i've got one here it says other than warsaw indiana <clears throat> what are the other manufacturing hotbeds from a geographical standpoint the Northeast um, probably would be another uh, geographic in the U.S. Um, there's also quite a bit, uh, speaking globally, um, uh, in the U.K., Ireland, um, those places. But I, I would say probably Indiana and the Northeast are the two hotbeds in the in the United States. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you. It's funny the similar similarities that we see. Uh, so when we kind of overlay uh, some of the the aerospace customers and the 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 medical implant customers, you know, very similar regions. So like you said, Northeast Europe is a, a big place. Um, and then gr growing presence in, in Asia and uh, as well too, as, as they start to ramp up and, and their uh, populations start to, to uh, not only be able to afford, but also age as well too. Yeah. Great. Well, with that, uh, we had some fantastic questions. I really appreciate everyone uh, submitting questions. And JD, thank you for much, very much for uh, being part of our conversation today. Some fantastic insights that you bring to the table. David, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, as, as usual, you always bring in some great viewpoints. Thank you, Mike. So, thank you, thank Michael. You yep. My pleasure. Right on. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, stay tuned for further uh, webinars from AVNR and we look forward to talking to everyone in the future.